that to distinguish between sort of the real First Amendment and the doctrine would be something of a fiction. So when he says, when he's talking about what's wrong with the First Amendment, he's talking about what's wrong with the First Amendment as construed by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and so you can think of this uh, partly as a reformist proposal, or mostly as a reformist proposal, but not necessarily addressed to the courts, could be addressed to all of us. Okay. So how, according to Steve, does the doctrine overprotect speech? Well, he, uh, the, the, roughly as is roughly the first two-thirds of the book, goes through various other values with which speech conflicts in particular circumstances, and says that the court strikes the balance wrong, and worse than that, doesn't even attempt to strike a balance but applies a highly formal, we would say formalistic approach in which uh, it's sort of rigged, is a loaded term, that the uh, speech value is going to prevail over the other values. So what are some of these other values? Privacy, important value, right? So think about Snyder against Phelps, the case in which the Supreme Court says that the First Amendment protects the right to have offensive signs near funerals, um, notwithstanding the severe intrusion on the privacy and the feelings of the mourners. Um, security as against cruelty and violence. Uh, so two Roberts Court cases feature prominently here. One is uh, Stevens against the United States, in which the court uh, strikes down as facially overbroad a law forbidding depictions of uh, legal cruelty to animals. Another is uh, Electronic Merchants Association against Brown, in which the court strikes down a California law that uh, limited the sale to minors of violent video games. In both cases, Steve says, yes, there's a free speech interest, but the court uh, doesn't pay sufficient attention to the interest on the other side. Another example of court undervalued and undervalued is equality. Here he has in mind cases protecting racist hate speech um, and pornography, uh, defined as it is, it has been in various circumstances as uh, uh, sexually explicit material that is demeaning to or exploitative of uh, women and thus undermining of equality. Um, another example, protection of commercial speech. He was especially critical of the cases uh, that uh, provide significant protection to commercial speech, which he thinks ought to be treated more or less in the way that we treat the regulation of the economy more broadly. Right, so there, it's not simply that he thinks that there are speech values on the one side and other values on the other, and the court is not paying sufficient attention to the other values. Here, he thinks there really isn't much of a speech value at all, except in very limited contexts. Uh, and finally, democracy. Here, he takes as his target the campaign finance uh, regulation cases, uh, not just Citizens United, but the entire line of cases in which he said he acknowledges that the court is not entirely wrong when it recognizes that uh, money facilitates speech, and so that limitations on campaign expenditures, for example, uh, do limit speech. But he says, once again, the court is not uh, recognizing all of the harm that's being done on the other side. Uh, overall, in the part of the book where Steve criticizes the Supreme Court for overprotecting speech as against other values, he accuses the court of what he calls free speech idolatry. Uh, and that's a term that cashes out doctrinally as a criticism of what he calls the frozen categories approach to free speech. So for those of you who haven't taken or have forgotten uh, the First Amendment doctrine, the basic rule, as announced by the Supreme Court, is that content-based restrictions on speech are subject to strict scrutiny, which means that they're almost certain to be invalidated, unless they fall into one of a limited number of proscribable categories. Uh, and, Steve says, under the Roberts Court, uh, those categories have been frozen 
uh, so that uh, there can't be any new categories, even if the new categories look closely analogous to the existing categories. All right. Uh, I'll come back to the frozen categories momentarily, but now let's look at the ways in which Steve thinks that the Supreme Court doctrine underprotects freedom of speech. Uh, and here I'll talk also about religion. The basic idea is that Steve thinks at its core, what the First Amendment is about is protecting the right of dissenters and minorities to criticize the powerful. Right? That's why we need a First Amendment. We don't need a First Amendment to protect powerful money interests. In speaking, we need it to protect people without power so that they can criticize uh, the powerful. This resonates with a lot of his earlier work. Uh, for those of you familiar uh, with that, you know, they romantic with respect to the First Amendment. I use that term in a particular sense that he's aware of. Um, and he goes, he, he, from this general notion, he criticizes particular doctrines as underprotecting speech. So, for example, uh, he thinks the court is, uh, applies insufficiently searching scrutiny to content neutral restrictions on speech when they infringe on the rights of, again, the powerless to criticize uh, the powerful. Uh, he thinks that the court's defamation doctrine is uh, under-inclusive with respect to who counts as a public figure and thus uh, the sorts of cases where there ought to be a heightened standard for a libel or slander plaintiff to prove libel or slander. Uh, although he also thinks that the doctrine is a little bit over-inclusive uh, in, in one or two ways. Uh, but his, his, just to make, make that concrete, um, if someone here were to make, make an allegedly defamatory statement against uh, President Obama or Donald Trump uh, or Hillary Clinton or any other uh, well-known public figure, if that party were to then sue you, they would have to prove not merely the falsity of your statement, but that it was uh, practically a knowing lie. By contrast, if you make that statement about, that sort of statement, that's allegedly a commentary statement, about someone who's not a public official or a public figure or a candidate for public office, uh, then lesser standards apply for plaintiffs. Steve thinks this ought to apply to people who are locally powerful. So a nice example he gives in the book is the dean of the Cornell Law School ought to be treated uh, as a public figure for purposes of local controversies. And so you might want to keep that in mind uh, if the dean of the Cornell Law School ever sues you for defamation. He also thinks the court's doctrine under underprotects student speech and employee speech. He thinks that it underprotects the institutional press, right? Treating the New York Times or CNN just like anybody getting up on a soapbox, notwithstanding the existence of a separate free press clause. Um, and then he segues to talk about religion to make similar points. That is, that the religion doctrine underprotects religious minorities. Here, Steve is something of an unreconstructed liberal critic of the Supreme Court's uh, decision in 1990 in Employment Division against Smith, which said that a neutral law of general applicability doesn't trigger any free exercise issue when applied uh, to somebody and, and burdens their religion. The case, the most famous case, that case involved uh, peyote use by a uh, Native American worshiper. Uh, and he thinks the case was wrongly decided. And thus, on normative grounds, he thinks the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, as for RIFRA, uh, is generally a good idea. Uh, although he thinks the Hobby Lobby case is just barely wrongly decided. He sort of agonizes over that one, uh, probably because the Supreme Court had its, had its facts wrong. All right. In each, let me say a few words now about, uh, by way of uh, critique. I think I'm going to put off talking about uh, Steve's causal account of how he got here in the interest of getting the other speakers up here. Uh, so in each of the chapters in which he criticizes the court for under-protecting, uh, or, sorry, for over-protecting speech relative to other values, he has a little bit of a comparative example at the end where he looks at European, Canadian, and other case law from other parts of the world uh, that expressly balances free speech against other values. Uh, and he suggests that that would be better if we were to do it here. 
By contrast, in the part of the book where he's criticizing the court for underprotecting speech and uh, minority religions, uh, Steve is uh, critical of the alternative approaches. He thinks that we do a bad job, but that Europe and the rest of the world do even worse, both with respect to, with respect to speech and free exercise, and also establishment, where Steve is, uh, thinks that there's uh, insufficient protection for minority religions as well. Okay. Let me finally uh, pose a question so we can get on to some others. Right? And, and the question is, what work, if any, is the First Amendment doing in Steve's theory? That is to say, is this a book about the ideal way to balance freedom of expression, free press, and religion against other values, in which the First Amendment uh, makes an appearance because that's the way in which we talk about it? Or is there any effort at all to derive, or at least connect, the, uh, the views that Steve has with the text of the First Amendment? So for example, uh, in one of the chapters, Steve criticizes a case called the Nebraska Press Association against Stewart, where the court seems to undervalue um, a defendant's right to a fair trial. Uh, it says it undervalues justice relative to press access to the, the court. Uh, that's a case where it's an unusual case in which the court might have thought it had to balance one constitutional right, the First Amendment, against another, the Sixth Amendment. And therefore, you might think, well, that's a hard case. But all the other cases he talks about are not officially uh, balancing a constitutional right against another constitutional right. They're balancing a constitutional right against some policy value. And so the question is, where do these policy values come from? Uh, are they ones that we're supposed to look for in society? Are they just, we just sort of know them when we see them? Uh, what's what's the, the source of this? Uh, if we think about this, the Roberts Court, the frozen categories idea, I think is rooted in a kind of misguided originalism that says, First Amendment protects the freedom of speech. What is the freedom of speech? Well, it's whatever it was at the founding, including being subject to its traditional exceptions. Uh, and so if you don't have one of the traditional exceptions, you don't have freedom of speech. I mean, you, you have freedom of speech, uh, and then you have to be uh, heightened scrutiny. And Stephen does a very good job of showing what's wrong with that, especially the fact that the existing categories are not really the categories as they were at the time of the adoption of either the First Amendment or the 14th Amendment, which now makes it out to the the states, but he doesn't tell us what his alternative theory is. And so I'd be interested in hearing from him, uh, if he has the time, uh, what his sort of jurisprudential theory is for uh, this book. But with or without a jurisprudential theory, it's a hell of a good book. <laughs> part of this celebration. Uh, this is my third uh, time uh, speaking here. Each time uh, the person who made it happen was Steve Schiffman. Um, and I'm delighted once again to be here. Uh, my answer to the question just posed is option B, and I'll try to explain why. Um, in my view, there are two basic kinds of academic excellence. I'm sure there's some others, but the two that I think are predominant are these. One, to produce a genuinely original idea. Now, admittedly, no idea is truly original, but for one's time and place and culture, sometimes, rarely, an academic says something genuinely new that has traction. Uh, second, the more common, is to offer an illuminating elaboration or qualification or application or delimiting or mapping of familiar ideas. Uh, that's what most of us do. Uh, not always illuminating, but we try. Uh, Steve is, is quite the exception, even among leading First Amendment scholars, in having done both. Uh, his 1990 book, First Amendment, Democracy, and Romance, introduced what I considered to be, and I spent a lot of time studying the, the history of ideas about free speech, a genuinely original idea, and that is the claim that we've lost our understanding or appreciation in First Amendment thinking of the value of romance. 
uh, of the rebel as an important contributor to, to the culture, to the society. Uh, and that we need to build First Amendment thinking, at least in part, on the importance of uh, the rebel. Uh, that really was different, and it continues to inform my thinking about, about the First Amendment, and many others as well. Uh, secondly, the skills of elaboration and qualification and application and so forth. Uh, and I think this new book does that better than anyone, any other book I've ever article I've seen about what Steve takes to be the growing thread of what he calls First Amendment absolutism or First Amendment extremism. But the way he works it out, maps it, identifies the different uh, patterns, the different dimensions of absolutism, is, is a real contribution. Uh, I'm going to explore that, and I want to use a famous case to do that. Uh, the case is Chuplinski versus New Hampshire, 1942. It took place in a small part of New Hampshire, a uh, town called Rochester, New Hampshire. Um, and Walter Chuplinski was a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, in the late 30s, early 40s, Jehovah's Witnesses were under uh, a great deal of broad persecution for their principle and refusal to salute the flag. Chaplinsky was on a sidewalk in front of the city hall of Rochester uh, when uh, a group of American Legion and other patriots uh, spied him and thought it would be very fun to make him salute the flag. Pushed him around, pinned him against a car trunk, uh, you know, put a flag in his face and made, you know, tried to make him salute the flag. Uh, the, the, the ruckus was broken up, and uh, a martial bowering of Rochester took him into protective custody. Uh, didn't arrest him, but thought that things were getting out of hand and it was important to get Chuklinski away from him. Uh, Chuklinski was a man of strong conviction, uh, and he looked Marshal Bowering in the eye and said, You're a damn fascist. The whole government of Rochester are fascists. Um, for that, he was charged with disturbing the peace. And he claimed he had a First Amendment right uh, to express that opinion to, to, uh, uh, to Marshall Lowry. He lost the case when it reached the Supreme Court. Uh, and what the court, uh, in the course of rejecting his claim, saying essentially that face-to-face -face epithets are not within the ambit of First Amendment protection, uh, the court said this, uh, it is well understood that the right of free speech is not absolute at all times and under all circumstances. There are certain well-defined and narrowly limited classes of speech, the prevention and punishment of which has never been thought to raise any constitutional problem. These include the lewd and obscene, the profane, the libelous, and the insulting or fighting words, those which by their very utterance inflict injury or tend to incite immediate breach of peace. It has been well observed that such utterances are no essential part of any explanation of ideas and are of such a slight social value as a step to truth that any benefit that may be derived from them is clearly outweighed by the social interest in order and morality. Now, several things are important about this Chuplinski picture. It, it is absolutely uh, lived out. Uh, it, it, it is discussed, invoked, distinguished over and over again, has been for you know, repeatedly all down, down uh, through the years. Um, and uh, there are several dimensions to it, this little dictum that I think um, Steve's book um, uh, you know, explains better than anyone has. One is the, the whole focus on the point of coverage. That is, uh, the key issue on Chaplinsky is not uh, when should speech be limited and when is it to be balanced against other social values? What counts as a First Amendment activity? And the court is saying in, in, in Chaplinsky, this isn't even a First Amendment activity. This has nothing to do with what the First Amendment is about, this kind of a face-to-face -face, um, uh, Secondly, to create categories defining what's outside the ambit of First Amendment coverage. Not just case by case, this is out, this is in, but trying to, to, to think about the subject at the categorical uh, level. Deciding what categories are excluded by using an overt, unapologetic balancing mechanism. How much harm does it cause? What kind of harm does it cause? 
uh, what contribution does it make to, to the, you know, serving the values of the, of, of the First Amendment? One of those variables is the value of the speech. It doesn't take it for granted that any use of words is valuable in First Amendment terms. And the whole point of the holding here was that face-to-face -face epithets uh, are not what the First Amendment is about as a, as a uh, uh, category. The way the court decides that is to ask whether what role face-to-face -face epithets play, uh, what their connection is to actually the exposition of ideas and the search for truth. It's a social benefit that is, is, is the, the uh, focus of the First Amendment and that how the categories have to be evaluated uh, in, in, in those uh, uh, terms. Now, uh, I think that Steve Schiffrin ought to be um, very happy with Chuplinski in those respects. Uh, it's, it's an absolutely important uh, president and, ex and victim in terms of the, the good fight against uh, uh, First Amendment absolutism. Now, um, given his earlier book about the importance of the rebel, one might think, and I don't think Steve, Steve addresses how I'm curious what he, what he thinks, one might think that Walter Szyplinski, even though he's engaged in a face-to-face -face epithet, is a face-to-face -face epithet with clear political content, and you might even think that the freedom to challenge authority in the way that Szyplinski does um, is very much uh, strengthened by uh, Steve's original contribution relating to the importance of the rebel and romance and so forth. But the basic uh, methodology and, and assumptions of Chuplinski are something that I think is central to, to, to Steve's uh, work. So much so that while I was driving up to my uh, for vacation in Maine this summer, uh, I noticed uh, the, the street sign noticed uh, informing of the uh, highway sign that uh, by just simply going off the road for 20 miles, uh, I, I could be in Rochester, New Hampshire. I thought instantly, I, I knew I was going to be giving this talk, uh, that, that why don't I um, check out you know, the scene of Chuplinski versus New Hampshire and see, you know, just be able to physically you know, feel it so before I talk about uh, Schiffer and Chuplinski. Uh, and I took a photograph, and I got a frame, and it's just yeah, to celebrate uh, the book. So, uh, here it is. Okay, now, now um, what, what Steve has done is to elaborate Chuplinski several dimensions. Let me just sketch them quickly. Um, I'd like to talk about how the fact that Chuplinski endorses balancing is something that Steve has not just embraced, picked up on, but you know, wonderfully elaborated as to how to do the, the, the balancing. Um, again, it, it's so important that Chuplinski says not every act of speaking is a First Amendment activity. He was, you know, his whole book is about, uh, about that in the new book. Um, also, notice that Chuplinski achieves his categorical exclusions with a functionalist argument. Yeah. What's the function of free speech? Uh, and and you know, is it served by this category of, of, of speech? Uh, and I think that's something that, that is, uh, you know, is, uh, very much consonant with, with, with Steve's uh, analysis. Now, uh, Steve carries it on in more detail in the book in terms of, of uh, regulatory rationales. And again, the court talks in terms of social values as the basis for, for limiting speech, but you, know, you have to give reasons why. And, and uh, Steve is very courageous in challenging conventional wisdom, in arguing, for example, that, that Regulating one person's speech in order to prevent the drowning out of other person's speech uh, is a legitimate regulatory interest, something that needs to be taken into account in a First Amendment uh, calculus. Paternalism, the court has developed a doctrine in which First Amendment paternalism is a complete no no. But no you, know, you can never just start regulating speech by deliberately keeping people in ignorance about something. Uh, Steve has a very thoughtful section in, in the new book about. Uh, not so fast. You know, there may be some uh, situations in which paternalism does even serve First Amendment values. Also, facilitating responsive speech. 
um, is, a, is a regulatory interest that uh, uh, Steve argues strongly for the current doctrine is very um, uh, hostile to, I think. Um, now, uh, another point that's central to this book is that the court has slipped into a kind of um, absolutism about the First Amendment, emphasizing so much, and Mike touched on this, uh, the prohibition on viewpoint discrimination or content regulation. Uh, and Steve's point is that that it, it reflects a kind of quest for a single idea or way to interpret the First Amendment. And it's much more, and he argues for what he calls an eclectic approach. Again, I think it's true to Chaplinsky that involves taking into a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of practical uh, considerations. And I think that that's, that's something that's to as was part of his, uh, his uh, contribution in this book, in terms of enriching or elaborating two months ago. Finally, I want to say, and I, 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 for this occasion, I went back and read not only Steve's 1990 book, but several articles he wrote in the early 80s. I just want to get a sense of the trajectory of his career. And this is something I didn't appreciate until uh, this assignment, so to speak, uh, how prescient he is. So much ahead of his time. The great fighting issues in First Amendment interpretation that we all thought of as having, you know, basically emerged in the last decade or so, Steve is talking about in the late 70s and, and early 80s. Uh, the centrality of the coverage issue, what in the first place counts as a First Amendment activity, uh, the dangers of getting so wrapped up in a single idea and having an essentially abstract understanding of the First Amendment. You know, he's all about overcoming uh, that abstraction. Um, the social benefits of individualism, if you read this book, it's very different than uh, a libertarian argument about free speech. Uh, it, it's all about how the society benefits from the realm. It's not just give me space to do my own thing. It's we depend for, for having mechanisms of change and for keeping our understanding up to date with the changing world around us. We depend on the rest. And the, the, the connection, you know, John Sir Mill uh, said this, and Steve picks up on that, and, and, and it's, it's so important, I think, in trying to understand today's free speech issues, but he was at it uh, uh, earlier. And then, uh, finally, the new epithet in First Amendment scholarship is First Amendment lockerism, that the court is basically noting the fact that lots of forms of economic regulation regulate representations that uh, various economic actors make. Um, and the Roberts Court has uh, interpreted the First Amendment in such a way that it uh, has the potential to, on a pretty wide-scale basis, uh, uh, in a sense, be a kind of end run around the prohibition on lockerism. And, and it's, you know, it's a different way to uh, challenge the regulatory state, so to speak. Um, Steve has an article in Northwestern Law Review in, in 1983 that's all about you're not going to be able to confine uh, uh, protection for uh, commercial speech only to truthful advertising. There's just so many other ways that the entire regime of economic regulation is now somewhat, but he's saying that in 1983. So, so uh, that's another academic virtue that, that you know very few possess appreciates he has in the public. So.
because Vince has a blurb about the book that has a, a way of summarizing the book that I hadn't thought of, uh, and it's much better uh, than that I, I really wish I had incorporated that idea uh, into the book. I'm very grateful for the nice things that have been said. Um, I, I think some of them are, I don't agree uh, with them. In the past, I don't think I'm that pressing them, but I, I'm grateful uh, for it. Um, I want to start uh, with what Shana calls the scaffolding of the book. Um, I am a follower, not of Immanuel Kant, but of Isaiah Berlin. I believe uh, that in the area of free speech, that there are too many values that interact in too many complicated ways to be able to hope or expect that you could emerge with a free speech principle that you could then apply and resolve matters across the broad spectrum of issues that are presented under the First Amendment. So that uh, you are forced uh, to more, less abstract approaches in order to be able to address those problems. Uh, when Shana says that she is a deontologic, de that she's deontological, and that the problem is the framing of the free speech principle. She might be right. And I like the fact that she wants to integrate privacy into that principle. And I would like her thinker-based approach. But I don't believe, uh, I think Isaiah Berlin's right. Now, if anybody's going to show that Isaiah Berlin is wrong, Sean is the one. Uh, but I uh, continue uh, to believe. As to the First Amendment or the court, uh, is it really fair for me to say what's wrong with the First Amendment? Isn't it really what's wrong with this court? Uh, my view is that with respect to the matters that I discussed in the first part of the book, that they are now deeply ingrained in the culture. Uh, liberals and conservatives uphold what's said there, with the exception of the democracy campaign finance uh, materials. Even commercial speech liberals on the court are protected. I don't think they're going to expand the protection to other areas, but they're protecting it. Um, as to the facts, uh, do do, does the deontological approach say uh, that the facts do not matter. Um, I said that in the book in the context of obscenity. I compare Kantians with millions. And the Kantians, in my view, think there's an absolute right to read what you want. And if this material causes harm, we have an, it doesn't matter, we have an absolute right. The millions want to know whether obscenity or pornography causes harm. If it causes harm in a substantial way, it ought to be regulated, thank the millions. If not, then it shouldn't. And the empirical evidence there is admittedly uh, problematic. What got me to write this book uh, is really the Roberts Court. Uh, the, this idea that speech, as opposed to freedom of speech, should be subjected to strict scrutiny, which has led to gruesomely violent video games sold to children being protected speech, depictions of animal cruelty, tobacco advertising when 400,000 people die every year because of smoking cigarettes, intentional infliction of emotional distress at funerals, the domination of election campaigns by the wealthy. When I thought about all that, I thought, I'm going to write a book. Uh, and so I did. Um, when I started teaching um, the First Amendment <laughs> a thousand years ago, the case law was a total mess. And I want to, uh, uh, I'm making this point to talk about what my method, uh, the methodology I am actually uh, proposing. I uh, wrote a long time ago that 
You have the cases, you have advocacy of illegal action, obscenity, uh, defamation, copyright. And they were all separate compartments in which they didn't refer to each other in terms of how they were resolving cases. And so I said, what's going on here is that they're looking at the importance of the state interest, the extent to which the state interest is advanced, the possibility of less restrictive alternatives, together with the impact on freedom of speech and the extent to, extent to which it is burdened. And First Amendment values, which include, in my view, liberty, freedom, equality, justice, tolerance, dignity, self-government, democracy, truth, marketplace values, the checking value, associational values, communitarian values, and cathartic values. Now, I do not agree. I agree that a deontological approach has to think very seriously about what the underlying values are, but so does an approach which is balancing all these factors. You have to think about what's important about the First Amendment. That's what the court was doing before the frozen categories approach, and that's what Euro Europeans have been doing. Um, it's called proportionality in Europe, and it, Israel is doing it. Um, Canada is doing it. And the difference between Europe, Canada, Israel, and the United States is that they are not irredeemably sloppy about applying the, the approach. Our court has always been totally sloppy, perhaps not even knowing what it was doing. And the frozen categories approach is a departure from that, which is to be not admired. Now, uh, Mike asks about Nebraska press. He says, there's a constitutional right, fair trial against free press. Um, does it matter that it's a constitutional right? And my answer is no, it doesn't. And it hasn't mattered. Because when speech comes into to conflict with reputation, there is a balance that goes on. It doesn't matter that reputation is not a constitutional right. It should be a constitutional right against government uh, out defending people, but it's not. Um, <coughs> order is not a constitutional right, and yet speech is balanced against order. In the case of reputation, you have a complex set of rules in which speech has is protected in more in the context of public figures and public officials than it is in the context of private persons, less on private issues than public issues. The rules are very complicated. Um, now, Mike wonders, if I give that answer, am I saying that the text of the First Amendment doesn't matter? Or does it even matter that the First Amendment's in the Constitution? Those, I think, are two separate questions. Question one, does the text matter? I don't think the text determines anything about the First Amendment. It doesn't say Congress, first of all, Congress has been read out of the First Amendment. And it says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech and press. What is freedom of speech? Freedom as opposed to license? And what is the freedom of speech? And does press mean that you get to do with the press what you do with speech? Or does is the press the institutional press which has independent significance? The text doesn't <coughs> answer that question. Uh, Mike, in some remarks he sent me, says, would it make any difference to you if it, the Constitution said, protect human rights and democracy? For freedom of speech, it wouldn't make a difference. Um, but that doesn't mean the presence of the First Amendment in the Constitution makes, <coughs> as a text, makes no difference for two reasons. First, <coughs> if government harms my reputation, I have no constitutional right. If government harms my freedom of speech rights, I have a claim against the government. And that's because it's in the Constitution. The second thing I would say is 
I believe there's a human and democratic right to food, clothing, housing, uh, medical care, but it's not a constitutional right. It should be. Our constitution is imperfect. It's far from perfect. But uh, that something is in the constitution that makes a difference. <laughs> the final thing I'll mention, um, and this is, oh, I forgot to uh, say about Chet Chetletsky. Um, <coughs> Vince and Sean had a wonderful article on Chetletsky. And I think Chetletsky was clearly, clearly, wrongly decided. Uh, <coughs> there's a lot of cases in the lower courts that raises this. Should you have the right to curse your local policeman when he's arresting you? And the, and the cases are divided. I think when you're speaking out against authority that you ought to be able uh, to um, be constitutionally protected. And there are, whole, you know, there are problems with police just saying, oh, you cursed me and therefore you ought to go to jail. Um, <clears throat> so I think Chap Hunsky's wrongly decided. I like the fact that Chaplinsky, Chaplinsky has accepted balancing. Uh, I don't like their balance. You know, the slight contribution to truth is outweighed by the interest uh, in order and morality. Uh, as I've suggested, there are many, many more values. Finally, I want to uh, mention and partially in response to Vince, and partially in response to Sean, um, commercial speech. Uh, Vince uh, refers to my Northwestern article. Um, he uh, kindly omits the fact that what I say in the book is contrary to what I say in that article, in the sense that in Northwestern, I said, that drug price advertising ought to be protected. Uh, I totally withdraw from that. Uh, a court that can end up taking that doctrine to protect tobacco advertising is a, is a court I cannot possibly trust with uh, commercial speech. And I think, and this speaks partially to Mike, uh, the the immersion of the First Amendment in a Constitution that embraces Republican, civic Republican principles speaks to the idea <coughs> both that our campaign finance laws are wrong and to the or constitutional principles and to why commercial speech should be excluded. That is to say, um, the People under, framers understood that the people are not saints, <clears throat> but they sought to have a form of government that would promote the public interest, would promote virtuous, public-spirited people that would make the government possible. We have 180 billion dollars of advertising every year. That promotes a hedonistic, consumer-oriented culture. And that form of <coughs> life may bring pleasure, uh, but it's at odds with the serving of others, the nurturing of relationships, the cultivation of character, and the development of a mature personality. I invoke a number of people in support of this view in the book. <coughs> Um, Bell, Marcuse, Galbraith, Reinhold Niebuhr, but my favorite is John Dewey. What he said is certainly true, at least at funerals. We praise even our most successful people, not for their ruthless and self-centered energy in getting ahead, but because of their love of flowers, children, and dogs. Thank you.